typically a GP who might be unaware of what menopause is, woman comes in and goes, I'm anxious, I'm tired, I can't sleep well, um, <clears throat> I my mood changes at the drop of a hat. And most of the time, the GP will be like, oh, it's because you're in your mid 40s, you're trying to raise a kid, you have a career, you have older parents, you're just too busy and too stressed. So we need to look at ways to decrease your stress. And this is not the right answer. Menopause 2.0 is your new training program to optimize performance for women around the menopause. I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about the program, what you think makes it so special, the key takeaways of what people can expect from following the plan and the results they can see. So it's really when we wrote uh, Roar, we had one chapter on menopause and got such uh, email deluge of women going, hey, wait, we need more information. <laughs> As I Okay. And I did my postdoc with Marcia Stefanik, who was the PI of the Women's Health Initiative. So I was very aware of all the um, aspects in and around these big databases of postmenopausal women and hormone therapy and exercise interventions. And I thought everyone knew that, right? But I was wrong. I was in my own little bubble. So we wrote uh, the chapter of Roar, and then I was like, we need to get this information out. So the whole aspect of menopause 2.0 is upskilled from the first menopause course that I put out. So it goes through the history of menopause, like what contextually it means from a sociocultural aspect, things like when we look at the witches that were at the stake in the Salem witch trials, most of them were women who were going through perimenopause because of the mood, the anxiety, the hot flashes, the irritability, they were just assumed to be witches. And so there's a huge history to understand how we got to be where we are with the tabooness around menopause. And then going through the different discussions of if you want to be more natural about controlling vasomotor symptoms and maybe you're not really having significant amount of symptomology, here are some things that we can do. But if you're having symptoms that are interfering with your daily life and you're like, I can't keep doing this, then there's options for menopause hormone therapy. Describing that, the history of that, what kinds of things to ask your physician. Then we get into what specifically we need to do from a training and nutrition standpoint, what kind of changes we need to make. If you're an endurance athlete, you're a power athlete, you're a general fitness person, or you're someone who now needs some structure. So we go through all of that. We talk about the gut microbiome and its influence. Um, different food options, different supplements, and then bring it down to case studies and a schematic of, of how you can work things out for yourself. I, I, when I'm researching a conversation with you, I found it quite astonishing how little in good information and research there was around this subject. Um, and I think, as you said, it's something that you almost took for granted being in your bubble that people knew this stuff. I mean, there's obviously two issues women women themselves not having the access to the resource and the information but then secondly their their main male partner in their life having if the woman has a very little idea the man probably has zero idea right how can a woman begin to implement some of the key strategies that are going to help her mood her body everything apart from her life and then secondly how much did should the men be playing a role in in supporting here rather than just kind of shrugging their shoulders and saying she's you know my partner's having an off day which seems to be almost that common you know comedy reaction i know it is i had this conversation yesterday actually with a guy who does a lot of consulting with companies and he's saying like in the c-suite the male executives are like, we need to get her off the team because she's having all these like anxiety, depression, these kinds of things. He's like, that's not the right answer. So we have to have men involved in the conversations. They too are aware of what's going on because men age in a linear fashion. So we'll see you know, the typical progression of aging, maybe some drop in testosterone when they get to their late 50s, early 60s. But for women, perimenopause is a definitive point in the sand where all of a sudden they're aging. So if we think about puberty and all the changes the bodies go through at puberty, where the boys lean up, they get stronger, they get taller, like more aggressive. The girls' hips widen, their shoulder girdle widens, center of gravity changes, they put on body fat, and then they get the menstrual cycle. We're at the other end of the spectrum now, where these hormones are starting to drop. So every system of the body is affected. So we're seeing things that 
typically a GP who might be unaware of what menopause is, woman comes in and goes, I'm anxious, I'm tired, I can't sleep well, um, <clears throat> I my mood changes at the drop of a hat. And most of the time, the GP will be like, oh, it's because you're in your mid 40s, you're trying to raise a kid, you have a career, you have older parents, you're just too busy and too stressed. So we need to look at ways to decrease your stress. And this is not the right answer. We need to be like, okay, these are symptomology of menopause. So the first thing that we can offer really is a venaflexine, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor but it's massively effective at stopping vasomotor symptoms and helping people get good sleep. Because if we can start to get good sleep, then we start to get a little bit better handle on what's going on. And then we can identify, hey, this isn't normal for me. So when we start talking about menopause, we need to have workplace involvement. We need to have male um, partners and colleagues and you know, even neighbors <laughs> involved in the conversation too, to reduce the taboo-ness around menopause. Um, how does so that, many sorry I was just gonna, uh, how does that uh, how does that conversation start because this isn't a new thing and it's 2023 well, when we're speaking we've we've still not seen any I've certainly maybe it's my own naivety but I've not seen any significant shift in the conversation around this the reason I wanted to speak to you was I couldn't find any good information around this why are we not seeing any change what's gonna what's gonna stimulate what's uh, gonna change it yeah. I know this was a sticking point yesterday when I was talking with um, Steve because he doesn't feel comfortable broaching it, right? Like how as a male can you broach this subject and be like, I think you're a menopause, right? It's really hard. It's a very, very much a taboo. And so it's like putting things into support saying, okay, well, in a workplace, instead of um, specifically saying menopause leave, we have more medical leave or more flexible time putting more mental health um, contributors and, and support in play. So if a woman is having significant issues and thinks, oh, well, maybe it's a mental health thing, get help there. And then they can be identified as, oh, this is perimenopause. Um, but just having kind of that awareness, the same as we are trying to break the taboo with menstrual cycle and having coaches and people talk about the menstrual cycle, it's taken years to get there. Now we're seeing menopause conversations more and more in popular media. So we're starting to see sort of see that that tipping point how we get that conversation not to be taboo I still don't know I'm still trying to figure that out because there's so much socio-cultural aspects around it that we have to unpack to make it okay to talk about so if we look at like the Japanese culture there's no word for hot flesh there's no real word for menopause because in their culture as you get older you're revered so there isn't the stress of it. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, now I'm an elder and I can exert my wisdom to everyone else. But in Western, a woman talks about menopause, she's automatically pigeonholed as being old. So career opportunities dry up. You see it in like uh, movie stars and actresses. Like as soon as they're thought to be old or menopausal, they don't get roles after age 40. Right. So it's good to see people like Naomi Watts and Oprah and Michelle Obama talking about it because it's starting to get that ball rolling. When it comes down to the general woman who thinks that she's going absolutely crazy when she's in her mid 30s, to early 40s, it's not normal. So she should be thinking, oh, I'm going crazy. Maybe I should be asking someone for help here. And that's the starting point. We got to get the women to understand what's going on and we need to get the GPs to understand what's going on. So then we can really kick that ball and make it roll fast. It feels like the rise of, of social media podcasts. There's more information available than ever before. And specifically on, on the menopause and the menstrual cycle for women, that information is there. If you're interested in it, it's probably easier to find than ever. The quality probably is the, the jury's out on social media and how great the quality is. It feels as though the major block now is educating men. And how does that start? Because if you're a man, unless your partner is going through it or you're very confused by what's happening in, in, in your home life, you might go and try and find some information. But as I've said, it's quite hard to find good information. Is this going to be the real, what's going to really nudge the needle is when we can find a way of educating men. For, for instance, a man going to the doctor for an issue, the GP hands him information on the menopause, getting it into his hands that way. I mean, I, I'm desperately trying to think of some other solutions here, Dr. Sue. Yeah. What, do you, would you agree that that is almost the, the, the bigger issue is the information is there for women now. How the hell do we begin to teach men about this? Yeah, and part of it is workplace and corporations. 
we're seeing quite a, there was a good conversation um, that occurred in the New York Times yesterday, and I'm happy to flick you the article. And in the UK, there's been a lot of conversation around menopause, menopause leave, menopause support in the workplace. So there's a couple of really good consulting companies that are going to come into corporations and start to educate. It just now started to trickle over to a few corporations in the States. So we're seeing it from the top end of corporations are now understanding they can't afford to lose their top executives who are women. How are we going to support it? And part of that is actually educating the male executives. So if we can get that part going, then they're going to come home and talk about it. And then that might, you know, snowball forward. But then from a grassroots level, yes, how are we going to educate people who aren't involved in the corporate world, right? How are we going to get this as a general conversation? Maybe going to the GP and getting information is something. Or maybe like in the States, you start to watch the 6 p.m. news and you're bombarded with all these Viagra ads. Maybe instead of Viagra ads, we have education about menopause <laughs> i'm not sure it would it almost did that division i certainly remember being a, a, at school when we had sex ed and the boys were taken off and told boy things and the girls were taken off and, and told girl things and it kind of looking back now as someone of my age it seems what an opportunity to teach boys and girls about each other rather than right. them. and you almost have that divide at such an early age that then you're on that path where you don't really ask or you don't really inquire about it and it seems like I'm not saying this is my solution, but have that conversation when kids are completely open to any conversation and, and keen to learn as much as possible. Yeah, there was a case study that I read and it was a small um, private school outside of London where they wanted to get the conversation about menstrual cycle and the difficulties of menstrual cycle across to the male students. So they had a small cohort of girls and they had girls whose really good friends were guys and they brought them into the room and the girls felt open talking to their best mates about what it meant to have their period when they went to school. They were worried about leaking. They were worried about sport. They were worried about, um, you know, a tampon dropping out of their bag and someone making fun of them. And the guys had no idea that this was the stress that their friends were under. Because when they took the step back, instead of just being a girl and girl things, and like, wait, this is my good friend who is experiencing this kind of stuff all the time, or at least this high stress once a month, then they started opening up and like defending and talking about menstrual cycle and spreading it around the school. Like, these are the things that we have to talk about and support our female friends and not make fun of them. I was like, that is such a great thing that needs to be rolled out everywhere because it's just taking that personalization to understand it's not just a girl, it's a good friend or it's a sister. And that's that connection that then normalizes things. I was at a conference and I was explaining menstrual cycle and that kind of stuff and tracking and things like wearables that don't take female physiology into account. So, you know, that's something else we have to be worried about as a coach. And I took a pause and I was looking out in the audience and I saw a lot of men had turned off. And so I was like, I'm not saying this is a feminist. I'm saying it from a historical perspective, because we look at how biomedical science and sports science and everything originated. It originated from a patriarchal um, doctrination because the men who started westernized medicine, who started the modern aspects that we know of research, at their time, they're like, women aren't that smart. They have smaller brains, they're delicate flowers, they shouldn't be involved. And so that's how all these protocols developed. But we know this from a historical perspective. And because we know this from a historical perspective, we can pause it and move forward. So now we see that we are moving forward, but it is going to take a massive snowball effect to try to break down that male lens and that patriarchal standhold because those things are so indoctrinated in everything we do in a day. So it's really difficult to unpack from that cultural aspect to then be able to have this big momentum to move forward. So don't be embarrassed that you didn't know anything. Because it's not the offsuit of you not seeking it out or not being able to. It's just the offsuit of what's happened from a historical and a cultural perspective.